Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We'll finish Hebrews chapter 2. We'll get into Hebrews chapter 3. You know where I'm going if you want to read ahead. Um, remember, the author of the book of Hebrews, we're not 100% sure who it, who it is. Many think it's Paul. Some people think it's Apollos. I think it probably is Paul, but remember, we know it's God's word, so God's the author. Now, remember, the Hebrews, they're in, in danger because some were believers, some were on the fence, some made a profession but really didn't believe, and they were basically, they were Jewish Christians, okay? Some really in the faith, some not in the faith, okay? And they were in danger because they were not going on to maturity in Jesus Christ. They were going backwards, some of them. They didn't want to give up the old types and the shadows and the, and the symbols and go on to the substance, which is Jesus Christ. So the author of the book of Hebrews very astutely, intelligently, um, systematically has to prove to these Hebrew Christians that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. Remember, that's what their faith was based on. It was based on the Torah, the Old Testament, okay? It was based on the writings of Moses and the prophets. Now, they were in danger because Jesus had come on the scene. Jesus had fulfilled all of the Old Testament pictures and types and shadows. And now they started to go back to worship God according to the Old Testament sacrificial system, which were what? Just types, the sacrifices were there. Why? The sacrificial system was there. Why? Because it was a picture of the perfect sacrifice that would come, God from heaven in the flesh, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. So they were still offering up bulls and goats, not going on to perfection and maturity in Jesus Christ. They were still worshiping God according to works, old ways, old habits, and not the newness and the life that they had now in Jesus Christ. And because of that, some of them were in danger. They were in danger of not coming to maturity in Christ. They were in danger of not coming to Christ. They were in danger of making a profession, but not a confession, just a profession in Christ, of Christ, in Christ, but not really knowing Christ. Okay, there's a difference. To profess is with your mouth. To confess is with your heart. And they were in danger of that. And the writer of Hebrews is telling them, wait a minute, let me explain to you just who this Jesus is. And he has to do it systematically through the Old Testament. And he starts off with who Jesus is, what he did, how he spoke, how God speaks to us. Remember he said, God who in sundry times, Hebrews 1, don't even have to turn there, in diverse manners, spoke in times past by the fathers through the prophets, in these last days has spoken unto us through his son, Jesus Christ. And then he says, God spoke in times past through the prophets, through Moses, through the Elijahs, through those things, through those types, through those signs, and through those symbols. But now he's spoken to us the greatest way through his own son, Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to describe who this Jesus is. He's the creator of all things. He's the sustainer of all things. He's the redeemer of all things. He's the giver of all things. He is what it's all about. And then he goes on to prove to them that Jesus is greater than all of the characters, all the people, and all the beings in the Old Testament to show them that they need to go on to get to know and mature in Jesus Christ. And he starts off with the angels. And he proves to them that Jesus is greater than the angels. He's greater than the angels because it says that he made the angels. If he created the angels, he's got to be better than the angels, right? But they're a little confused because he became a man. And it says in the Old Testament that God used the angels to give Moses the law, the Old Testament. So the angels are pretty powerful. So why didn't he become an angel? He took on the nature of man, not an angel. Because redemption and salvation is for humankind. Angels cannot be saved, the fallen ones, okay? So he took on the nature of man to give us eternal life, to pay the penalty for our sins. Angels were created all at once, 
all named all at once. Some of them chose to rebel and sin. Some of them stuck by God, but they cannot be redeemed. We can be redeemed. Jesus died for us, not for the angels. The Bible says the angels desire to look into the things of salvation. Some people think that means the fallen angels trying to look into it so they can be saved, but they can't be saved, okay? And he explains to them that Christ is better than the angels, that Christ is better in chapter three, we'll get into that, than Moses. Christ is better than Abraham, Aaron, all of the Old Testament characters and scriptures because Jesus Christ is what our faith rests in. Jesus Christ is the culmination of all the revelation of God. Everything meets together in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And, and, and he left off, it, it, we left off explaining, he's explaining to these Hebrew believers, some unbelievers, some believers, about how Christ is better than the angels but that he, part, he took on the nature of man. Let's look in verse 10. I think we made it down to verse 15, but we'll read through it. For it became him, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So he, he made all things, he is all things, he did all things, and he wanted to save us, right? How did he save us? Through suffering for us. For both he that sanctifieth and those who are sanctified are all one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed to call sinners like us his brothers and sisters, right? He's not ashamed of us. I'm, I'm sometimes ashamed of myself. We're sometimes ashamed of ourselves and one another. But Jesus Christ is not ashamed of us. You say, Pastor Matt, if you knew what I did this week, in my thoughts and maybe even in my deeds and in my home, you'd be pretty ashamed. I'm pretty ashamed. But you know who's not ashamed of you? Jesus Christ. I don't know why. You, you know, the Old Testament rabbis used to say, he loves us just because he loves us. He loves us just because he loves us. That's why. I can't figure it out. But he loves us. He's not ashamed of us. That means all the thoughts, the sick thoughts that go through my mind, sometimes the things I do, he's not ashamed to call me his brother. The father, his son. He's not ashamed right? He died for us. He says this, I will declare the name, verse 12, unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my, put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God gave me, he's quoting the Psalms, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that, listen, that through death he might destroy him that has the power over death, that is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not, not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, okay? When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he did not become an angel. By the way, there's a, there's a whole belief out there in one of the cults that says, you know, Jesus, you know, is Michael the archangel, and Lucifer was his brother. So Jesus is Michael. Craziness, okay? That's not biblical, just so you know, all right? He didn't take upon himself the nature of angels. God took upon himself the nature of a man. So he can identify with us. And there's a reason why he's going to explain it to us. Now he just told us that he would take away death and the fear of death. You know, you don't have to fear death anymore. I talked about this last week. I won't get all into it. We fear death because we've never been there. Right? If you died and came back, let me know. I'll tell you you didn't die and come back. I know your heart might have stopped for 30 seconds or whatever. You didn't die because if you died, your spirit and your soul would be separated from your body. All right? You'd either lift up your eyes being in torment. If you don't know him, if you know him, you lift up your eyes in glory, beholding him. Okay? We fear death because we've never been there. We fear death because we know, hmm, what if I have to be accountable to somebody after I die? Unbelievers, they fear death. 
but they'd rather take their chances than repent. Jesus said in John 3, men love darkness rather than light, right? But he delivered us from that death and from the fear of death. That when we die, we just go through the shadow of death. It's just a shadow. The Bible says life's like a dream. Boom, it's like a dream. And you know you dream and then you wake up and you remember part of that dream and you're not sure what it was all about. Finally, when you get there with him in heaven, you're gonna be like, I was so fixed on those 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years I got to live. Now it's just like a dream. It was just a little fragment of what life really is in eternity with God. See, that's life. Jesus died for us to give us that life, eternal life with God forever. Now look what it says. He died for us. He didn't take on the nature of angels. Remember, he's proving to these Hebrew readers that Jesus is better than the angels because he's God become a man to redeem man. He took on the nature of a man. Wherefore, in all things, listen, verse 17, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. What does behoove mean? Behoove mean it was fitting for him. He wanted to do it. Remember it said in Philippians, in chapter, in Philippians chapter 2? Jesus, you know, though being very God of very God, thought it not robbery, right? That he was equal with God. He took upon himself, upon himself the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men. He didn't sit up there in heaven and say, hey, I'm God. And I need to hold on to the fact that I'm God. I can't come down there and be with those wretched people. He said, he, the Bible says in Philippians 2, he thought it was no big deal that he was God. And he condescended. And he was, born, he was conceived in Mary's womb. And he lived a life just like me and you get to live. One life. Except that life was perfect, sinless, and spotless. Right? People say, if there's a God, he's got a lot of explaining to do. If there's a God, why do these things happen? If there's a God, why are their children starving? If there's a God, why are there wars? If there's a God, why don't I have the house that that guy has across the street? If there's a God, why this, why that, and why everything else? If there is a God, how come? That's what they say. You know what the Bible says? That there is a God. And he could fix starvation just like that. He can give you that better house just like that. He can give you children if you've been trying for them just like that. He can do all those things for you. But those things would only be temporal things. See, what Jesus did is different. He came to this earth to die for our sins so that in that place, in that heaven, forever, there's no more tears, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. He says, behold, I make all things new. And John the Revelator is getting that revelation of no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more of any of that, for the former things are, 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 are passed away. Right? Right? And he kind of fades off as he's getting this revelation. And Jesus wakes him up. He taps him on the shoulder. And he says, write these things down because it's faithful and it's true. He says, you can put it in the bank. It's a done deal. That's what Jesus came to do. Not just fix everything in this life, but to give us new life forever. Eternal life. Because if God paid all your bills and you still died and went to hell... What would life be worth living? If God gave you 10 children, you might not have none, you might have one, you might want more, but if he gave you those 10 children and you all died and went to hell, what's the use of it? If God fed all the kids that are starving right now, and there are, and they all died and went to hell, what would be the use? No. He fixed it all by giving his life on a cross. To make all things new, right? Watch what he does. As a man, wherefore in all things it behooved him 
to be made like unto his brethren, that's to become a man, that he might be what? Here's the first thing, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. You see that? What did the high priest do in the Old Testament? What did the priesthood do in the Old Testament? The priesthood did what? They were a go-between. What's a go-between? A go-between was, was what? The people needed to bring something to God, needed to have access to God. And the priest was there to help the people have access to God, to be that go-between. But there was a difference with that priesthood as opposed to Jesus' priesthood. See, a priest is a go-between. The, the Bible says in the New Testament we don't need a priest anymore because it's very simple. It says we have a great high priest whose name is Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. A priest is a mediator. You can go directly to God through Jesus Christ, the God-man, right? But what did the priest do? He was a go-between. And there was something different between those priests and our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Those priests, you know what they had to do? They had to offer up a sacrifice for their own sins first. Okay? They had to be cleansed. And they had to offer the sacrifice for their own sins first. And I'll bet you a lot of those priests, if you read about some of the priests in the Old Testament, they were not merciful. They were not faithful. Some of them were scam artists. By the time Jesus comes on the scene, remember you have the high priest Annas and this and that, and they got this whole temple treasury thing going on to take advantage of the people. That was what happened to the priesthood, the high priesthood. That's what happens in churches and in, in denominations sometimes when, when religious leaders take advantage of people. Sad. But the Bible says that he wanted to be made like unto his brethren so he could be a merciful and faithful high priest. He's always merciful to us. He's always faithful to us. He never fails us. I'll fail you. You'll fail each other. Husbands will fail wives. You know, wives will fail husbands, kids, and everything else. But he will never fail you. Ever. Because he's faithful. And he's always merciful. Always even when he chastises us, and God's chastisement hurts more than any a man's chastisement, he still does it because he's merciful. Because he doesn't want you to be, 1 Corinthians 11, condemned with the world. Right? So why did he become a man? Why? Yes, to be merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Listen, secondly, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Literally what he did was he satisfied God's wrath because God hates sin. Hates it. God is so holy, the Bible says that he cannot even look upon sin. One sin, the sin of Adam and disobedience, condemned the whole human race. God hates sin, but what did Jesus' death do? Death do. It made reconciliation for the people. God hates sin. Now listen. God's wrath has to come against sin. It's kind of like this. If my children are out playing in the yard or whatever, and there's this rabid dog, Right? This big, rabid, you know, pit bull, rottweiler, whatever you want to have. Foaming at the mouth that is just annihilating them, biting them, you know, throwing them all around, destroying them. Okay? Am I going to go there and say, hey, don't do that. Pat them on the head. Give them a bone. No, I'm sorry, you animal lovers. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to boot that thing in the head. And if I have a gun, I'm going to kill it before it kills my children. Right? Sorry. Maybe he'll be resurrected on the last day. I don't know. <laughs> but you get the picture. You get the point. My wrath would come against that dog, right? It would come against it to the point that I would destroy it before it destroyed my own, right? That's what God did for sin. 
See, he saw something valuable in you, though sin dwelt in you. He saw something valuable in you because you're created in his image, and that image is marred by sin. And he saw something valuable that he could redeem. He could destroy the sin in you without destroying you. I don't get it. I don't know how. Because I still know that sin dwells in me. But I know that Jesus took it all. And I know that one day, can you imagine one day never to have an evil thought, evil motive, evil action? How? How? But I know as the new life in Christ keeps dwelling in me and living in me, I get little glimpses of that. I get little glimpses of the power of Christ that, you know what? Wow, you know what? Matt Nadwani would never do that. That only had to be Jesus Christ. Matt Nadwani would never have that kind of patience. That only would be Jesus Christ. New life in Christ is real. See, he came to be our faithful high priest and merciful high priest, our go-between to God. He came to pay, make reconciliation for our sins. Literally, that means that God was satisfied. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, God said, you're paying for all of their sin, so I don't have to punish them. I'll punish you. And he was satisfied with it. You know, the Bible says, you know, we think that, you know, the father, he's kind of standoffish and he's kind of angry. And it's the son that's kind of merciful. You know, and the Holy Spirit, we can't figure him out. Is he like a, a wind, a ghost, or this or that? No, they're all God. All right? But the Bible says it pleased the father to bruise him. It pleased God the father to bruise his own son, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he made his soul an offering for sin. It pleased God the Father to bruise Jesus because he loved you and because he loves me. I can't can't imagine that. The Bible says in, in, in John chapter 17 that Jesus prays to the Father. He goes, Father, let them know that the same way you love me, you love them. I, I don't get that. But that's what it says. What else did he do in becoming a high priest? For in he, listen, in that he himself had suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor, that's old King James, them that are tempted. He came to what? Be a merciful high priest and things pertaining to God. He came to pay for your sins and satisfy God's wrath. And he came, know what secure means? Know what that old King James word means? It means this very simply, run to the cry of a baby. That's what it means. Run to the cry of a baby. That's what it means. He came to empower us. He came to empower us. No wonder why when Paul writes to the churches, he says, sin shall not have dominion over you. It cannot. It shall not, because he came to empower you. But see what it says here? For in, listen, that he himself suffered. How did he suffer? Where? Being tempted. The Bible says he was tempted in all things. Just like we are. You know what that means? He knows what it means to be forsaken. He knows what it means to love his own, his own twelve, and one betrays him, and one denies him. And the other ten run away while he's being crucified. He knows what it is to have someone turn their back on him. He knows what it is to go hungry and without food. He knows what it is to be depressed and down and out and left alone. He knows all of those things. And since he was tempted in all those things, and he went through all those things, and he never sinned, since he never sinned, now he's able, able to run to you, secure you, the old King James says, that are tempted. You know what that means? That means when I'm going through something, 
and I feel angry or betrayed and I lack patience and everything else that is in me. Jesus died for that on a cross. And if I just surrender myself to what the Holy Spirit's already telling me and I go to God and I say, God, you know what? Help me. Help me. Because I don't have patience right now with my wife, with my children. Help me, God, because I want to be lazy right now. Help me, God, because I want to take advantage. Help me, God, because I want to cut corners. Jesus never cut any corners. You know what? I do. He doesn't. And he's able to come to run to my aid and save me. Because he knows what it feels like. And he defeated it. And he's able to give you that same strength and that same power. That's why the Bible is so simple. You have all these churches out there, and there's this whole self-esteem movement and everything else. The only self-esteem I have is that God loves me, he died for me, and I need Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. But in Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Right? Because he's able to come to my aid. He's able to do it. He runs to my cry. The Bible says, that's why the Bible says, when you're weak, that's when you're strong. Because when you're weak, that's when you're at the point where you're saying, Lord, I can't. I need you. Help me. Yes, now I can help you because you're humble enough to let me help you. See, to me, it's so simple. If you don't know this, you need things to survive. You're a creature. I need air to breathe. I need food to eat and sustain me, right? I need those things. I need water. I need things to sustain my physical frame. And if I need, and you know what? God is so merciful, so faithful, so gracious. You know what? If I had to tell my heart to beat and my liver to do whatever that thing does and all those ugly things in there, if I had to tell it to do those things, I, I'd forget and I would be dead. I don't know how to do it. He's so merciful. He just does those things. But I need things to survive. And if I need things to survive physically, do I not need something to survive spiritually? Do I not need somebody to run to my aid? And help me and save me? I do. So don't you. Listen. He's able to run to the cry of the needy. I'm going to tell you a story and the ladies are going to get freaked out. The other day, we're painting at my house. Me and a, me and a couple of the guys, right? And my kids, one of my, old, my oldest son, Matthew, comes out to me. Dad, dad, he comes screaming. Luke's choking, Luke's choking. So first I think, no big deal. He's choking, it's crack, it's nothing. It's always something. But I come running in, and then I saw the look on his face. I'm like, I knew something was wrong. He's really choking, right? And he's, like, and he's gasping, he's gasping. But I ran to him. I picked him up. I held him. I slammed him. I slammed him. I slammed his back. It didn't come out. I looked at him. He's like, he's still, there's no way. I'm, I'm freaking, right? I'm screaming. I'm like, what is it to the kids? What is it? I didn't know what he had in his mouth, right? But I'm screaming. I'm there. I'm at his aid. I'm helping him as much as I can. And then finally, I slammed him in the front of the chest. And then, boom, a marble popped out. I don't know. It was my daughter's little toy. She let get somewhere else and whatever. And I saved him. And I ran to his aid. Because I was the only one that was big enough and strong enough to do it. Right? He's the only one that's big enough and strong enough to deliver you and to deliver me from our selfish ways sometimes. He's the only one that's big enough and strong enough to get you through what you're going through sometimes with your finances, with your jobs, with everything in life. He's the only one that's big enough and strong enough to pick you up and deliver you from those things. No one else. He's the only one. See, since he was tempted in all things and he defeated it, 
He's strong enough to run to your aid. But here's the question. Now, here's the thing. Why do we sometimes want to run everywhere else? Lord, I'm down. I'm depressed. Lord, I know what your word says, and you even have done it for me before. But I'm going to run back to the bottle. I'm down. I'm depressed. I'm out. You've even done it for me before, but I'm going to run back to the drug. Uh -uh. I'm going to run back to the sexual promiscuous lifestyle for fulfillment. I'm going to run back to the greed or whatever it is, to the selfishness. If he's strong enough, the only one that's strong enough, listen, because he's a merciful and faithful high priest. He's a merciful and faithful go-between who gave his own life for us. Why don't we want to run to him sometimes? Why? Why don't we want to run to him? See, I'll tell you why. This is what I think. I think it's biblical. I think because we know that he's able. We know that he's powerful. We know that we can do what he says he can do. And we know that he loves us. But sometimes we just want to sin. Listen. Because we don't want God to really live in and through us and change our character. Really. Because it's hard. It's hard. It's hard when I have to continually fall on my face and go to God over and over again and say, God, this is really who I am outside of you. And to continually humble yourself over and over again. And God just says, you know what? You are just a sinner. But in me, you're a saint. In me, you're righteous and perfect. There's still something in us that says, God, I want to be something outside of you. I want to be something myself without you. Still something in there. A little bit of Adam still there. Right? Just a little bit. Sometimes. But God created Adam to be a reflection of him. Right? And who did he reflect? He reflected Jesus Christ. Jesus, the humble king, the merciful king, the faithful king, the beautiful king, the holy king. That's who he ref reflected. It's so, un pride is so foreign to God. Think about it. The only one that can be proud and have a right to be proud is God. Only one. Nobody else can. But he's the only one that's not. He said, then why does God get all the glory? Why do we give him praise? Why do we give him honor? Why do we do this? Is he sitting up there like this? Like after these people score a touchdown like this? Yeah, I'm the man. <laughs> Bow down when I come to your town. All right? right? Is, that, is that what he does? No. No. You know what he does? When we worship him, when we bow down, we're acknowledging who he is in his presence. You know what he does? He doesn't say, yeah, that's right. He knows we're most satisfied when we're in that state because that's his nature, the humble nature. You know what he does? He pours back his nature into us.